Good morning. Good afternoon. Good evening. Um, Hello. We'll just wait. Hello. We'll just wait a few more minutes to allow a few more people to join. Hello everyone, we'll just wait one or two more minutes to allow a few more people to join. Okay, um, I think we should we should start. Um, today we have uh, two main items on the agenda. The um, Project Vineyard team um, are going to uh, follow up from the presentation that they that they gave us uh, at the last meeting with with um, uh, a quick uh, demo, um, and then we'll move on to uh to uh, further technical discussion of um rafaela's um the r document which has been coming along nicely so uh with that i'll hand over to the alibaba team for project vineyard demo uh thank you alex uh um, hello everyone my name is Wen Yuan Yu and uh uh, I'm from Alibaba Damo Academy, uh, uh, and today my colleague Andy and Tao and I are going to uh, demonstrate our system as a follow-up of last presentation. Uh, uh, Andy has, um, has shared the screen. Uh, yeah, uh, uh, Vineyard, Vineyard is a, a in-memory mutable data manager uh, and pro provide out of the box high level abstraction and zero copy in memory sharing for distributed data in big data tasks. And uh, if, if you want to know more technical details, you can refer to our repo. Also, you can uh, look at the decks of the last since uh, last uh, SIG meeting. And uh, I will first uh, introduce uh, a big data task we are going to demo, and then I will hand uh, hand the microphone to my colleague Andy, and he will then go through the, all the running vineyard on Kubernetes and so on. Okay, the task we focus on it's like uh, it's a, a simplified version of what we do in Alibaba. It's for fraud detection. 
uh, currently a, a fraud transaction indicates a customer deceptively purchased an item uh, hoped, hoping for to inflate the rating of the item. And uh, in the demo uh, example, we use pandas and Mars for distributed processing to prepare the data set and then use PyTorch to train a fraud transaction classifier. And uh, we integrate one out of it, these two systems. Uh, first, we can check the data, uh, the, the code. Oh, data, yeah, data first, sure. Uh, the data we use uh, actually from a few CSVs, typically Vineyard and the application built on top designed for handle large data, but uh, today for demo purposes, we, we just always use a small data just to speed up the, the process. But you can imagine those kind of data can live in uh, HDFS or something. Uh, the schema of the data is like uh, the follows. Like item is something like items listed in a e-commerce website like Amazon or Alibaba. It begins with an ID and uh, then they follows by like several numeric features. And the user, uh, the user table is similar as indicates each entry indicates a user and it starts from ID and uh, followed by a few feature, features. And the transaction like indicating a purchase from a user uh, with an item. Uh, the first two columns are the user IDs and the item IDs. And the third column is a label like you to indicate whether this transaction uh, we have labeled as a fraud or not. We use this label for training and followed up by a, a few like a transaction features. Like for the actual classification, we, we, uh, we actually, we, we join those two uh, to to three tables together to to have a very wide uh, lots of attributes, lots of features uh, table for transactions. Let's look at the data. Uh, uh, sorry, the, the code. Uh, like a, a simple like uh, one single machine version is using pandas. Uh, we use pandas to load data from CSVs and load them as a data frame as a pandas data frames, and uh, we do a using a join like to, to expand, to get a new data frame and uh, it's called a data set. And, the, and then we uh, like, yeah, combine features is to do the, this. And then we can go, uh, can, you, can you scroll down please? Yeah, uh, and then we, we uh, sorry, oh, okay. We use the, the make data sets to to the, the function to like to convert those pandas data frame to num high and uh, uh, to be a a, a, pan, a pytorch tensor data set and then we we import pytorch and it's a, just a simple like one layer in for classification like okay, it's uh, to taking taking input as uh, taking the data set as input. But uh, uh, what if those uh, data sets are large? Like let's just imagine those CSVs are too large to be handled on a single machine. We need to do the distributed processing. In this case, we use Mars. Uh, it's also a project from Alibaba. It's, uh, you can think it has a parallel or distributed NumPy, Pandas, uh, and the Scikit, the Scikit Learn package. Okay, let's go back to the code. Uh, the, uh, it's, uh, the code itself, it looks pretty like similar to the version in pandas, you see, um, but there are a few notable differences. Uh, first, like the data frame here, it's a, the Mars data frame here is, a, is different from the pandas data frame. Uh, here, the Mars will slice the, the actual data frame into multiple chunks and the dis di uh, distribute the chunks into multiple nodes and machines. And you can see Vineyard provides the IO ability for Mars uh, because like uh, for, for Vineyard, um, uh, it not only supports the local data IO, but also supports like IO from uh, remote HDFS and uh, various like uh, data sources. 
and uh, for the, the those the, com the the actual drawings, like uh, say the the like the, uh, Andy, can you select the, the yeah for the actual drawings? Uh, uh, the, uh, it's quite similar to the pandas, in, uh, except that uh, for Mars, it's actually uh, this, uh, uh, like uh, the job actually done as the, in the chunk level, like it will split those the, the drawings of uh, actual data frame into the, the drawings of those chunks and the reshuffle the data if necessary. And uh, for, for this part, we, we only like taking care of the processing. Uh, in this script, we only taking part, uh, taking care of the pre-processing part. We, uh, we just opt output a uh, one yard uh, object as a global data frame. Uh, we will like go back to the PyTorch part later. Uh, I will next hand the microphone to Andy. Andy, you can you can take him over from here. Uh, thank you, Wenyuan. Uh, and thanks, uh, Tao, for for the code demo. Okay. Uh, now uh, let's uh, first check the, our environment. Uh, here we have a, a Kubernetes cluster with eight nodes, and there is no pods running. Um, now we install uh, Wenyuan with Helm. Uh, then we check the CRDs. Here we have the global objects and the local local objects CRDs from Wired. Uh, then we run mass now. Oh, okay. Uh, uh, Wired is it, now running as a daemon set on the Kubernetes uh, cluster. Okay, now we can run mass now. Uh, uh, this process will take about one minute. Uh, it will join the three tables and, and produce a, a global data frame in one yard. Let's wait here. Okay, we get the global data frame uh, with this uh, object ID. Uh, ID, and then we check the CRD. This is the global object CRD uh, represent this uh, global data frame, and also this global data frame is partitioned into chunks, uh, and these chunks are distributed uh, over two nodes. Uh, they are 192 and 193. Uh, now we check the, the pods. Uh, we can see that the, the one yard uh, pod on node 192 is, is this one. So we log in this uh, uh, one yard pod to, to, to get a chunk to, to see how exactly the chunk looks like. Uh, we first import Wired. Then we establish a client connect, connecting to the IPC socket uh, of Wired. Then we can get the, the chunk. We will choose a chunk uh, lying on the uh, 192 node. Uh, okay, now we get the chunk. Uh, uh, actually, the chunk data is mapped from the one other process to the Python process uh, with shared memory in a zero copy fashion. And the, the chunk data is automatically uh, resolved into a pandas uh, data frame since we already registered the pandas data frame resolver to one uh, For the detail about memory mapping and the resolver registration mechanism, uh, please refer to the one other document. And now we try to uh, get uh, uh, another chunk that is not located on 192. Uh, for example, this one, okay. Then we find that we, we can't get, get that uh, chunk. 
uh, this means that when we try to get the chunks from uh, one another, we, we can only get the local chunks. Now let's look at uh, the PyTorch code. Uh, that will be the, the next step we are going to run. Okay, compared with the a single machine version, uh, uh, the make data set from one uh, is, is a is a different uh, here. Okay, here we, we have to first connect to the wired IPC socket and get all the lo local chunks. And we can concatenate these chunks uh, into a merged uh, data frame. Then, then the rest part are, are just the same as the uh, single machine version. Okay, uh, so when we deploy the PyTorch uh, pod uh, on Kubernetes, uh, what if the pods are scheduled to the nodes that doesn't have any chunk uh, chunk of data, uh, then then the PyTorch can't get uh, uh, any data from Wired. So let's look at the state for set YAML uh, of of our uh, pod job uh, of our PyTorch job. Hello, Tao, are, are you still there? Okay, uh, I will, sorry, sorry. We can hear uh, you just fine. Uh, I, I think Tao is, uh, is, is offline, so, so uh, he's not. Uh, Tao, Tao is the one actually typing those commands. <laughs> so uh, I, I, will, I will try to find the code, okay. Um, uh, Oh, I see. <laughs> this is uh, this is this is what this is what happens when you're extremely brave and do a demo online live. Yeah, replica one demo. <laughs> <laughs> it's not a live demo if something doesn't go wrong. So don't worry. This is this is all good. Okay. Uh, let me find it. Um, so, uh, uh, maybe we should uh, wait a few minutes. Can I ask a question while we're waiting? Okay, uh, Andy, can you can you describe the the your memory allocation? Uh, how that's going on, and you know what uh, what kind of rules you're using, and and how the the memory that global memory is getting allocated and and decided if there's enough to do the application and things like that. Uh, okay. Uh, here, um, uh, currently, we didn't have a, a very specific. Uh, very sophisticated uh, strategy. Uh, in, in now, if the if the, the memory is not enough, when we create the uh, the object, we uh, we will we will uh, return the 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 message to the client, uh, t t tell them that the, the memory is, is not enough. So you were, so you had two servers there. And you allocated the me during the allocation of the memory. Um, if the two servers were, weren't enough, it uh, you would get a message so to try to pull in more. Is, is that is that the use case or how you how you see it getting used? Actually, uh, the, I... the, uh, yeah. Uh, let me uh, like share a bit more on this. Actually, we uh, with the helm like we need to specify. Specify how much memory can one yard use, like in the helm, um, the command. And then after one yard is deployed, and the, the, the memory like consumed by one yard is fixed, it's not no larger than eight gigabytes in our demo case. But uh, you can specify when launch a daemon set of one yard, like how much memory you want, uh, what one yard have. Uh, so we does not have a dynamic like um, adjustment on the, the 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 size of the the, the memory one can consume. 
And for the memory allocation, we use a very simple version of a single thread uh, memory allocator. Uh, it's it's um, it's the same as uh, Plasma. I, hi, Tao, can, I, are you back with us? Uh, hi, Tao, can, uh, yeah, yeah, you can, you can show us the, um, the spec, the, the, the stateful set YAML now. Uh, okay, so so uh, I, I just uh, uh, described the, the the case that when when the pod is is not scheduled to the to the place uh, that that the the chunks are located. Uh, in this case, we will uh, add the the one add migration uh, to the init container, and this is a a, fun, a, a function uh, provided by one uh, to to migrate the data chunks when, when the chunks are not uh, located at the same node as the pod. Okay, so uh, now, now let's uh, run, run the PyTorch job. And we give the uh, object ID of the global data frame uh, as the required uh, object ID. Okay. Uh, now we check the pod. Uh, we can see that the, these two uh, PyTorch pod are are scheduled to node 188 and 187. Uh, they are not the same node as the chunks are located. Uh, they are 192 and 193. So let's check the logs of uh, the worker zero. Uh, we can see that, see that the, the data migrations are, are triggered here and and the data migration is actually time consuming. And uh, now we check the, the, the local objects. Okay, for this uh, local object, uh, it has been uh, replicated here. So it is replicated from 193 to uh, 188. Uh, so that the, the pod on node 1188 can use this chunk. So here we can see that the data migration is both time and space consuming. So is there any way that we can reduce the data, migra uh, data migration uh, as much as possible? Uh, here we, we, want, we, we try to use the uh, scheduled plugin in, in Kubernetes to solve the problem. Okay, so we first uh, reset the environment. And, and we, we will run mass to get a new global data frame. I just read the pod ready. Hey, while, while we're happen. waiting, just, just just a quick question there. So, so effectively, you have a set of source data, which then gets sharded across, you know, a number of nodes, and then you can start your um, your your workload that consumes that data on any node within the cluster, and it will pull the relevant segments to the node where the where the where the job is running, right? Yeah, correct. Cool. I have a question about the design. Why did you decide to have an explicit step to pull the relevant shards 
as opposed to maybe just let the client, in this case, the Python application say, I want this global shard and have the, and the vineyard locate the, the needed, you know, the needed and do the migration on demand. Instead, you're doing an explicit, you know, in a container step to do the shard migration or replication. Is there a, is there a reason? Uh, uh, I, I can explain um, because like uh, those kind of tensor need to be like uh, the other case that cancer need to be like uh, used immediately after the, 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 the process was launched. Just, just because the case we first, we need to convert those like data frames to tensors and uh, we need to get all the data frames, at least a chunk, the, the whole chunk to get the job started. Uh, we have a mechanism for pipelining, like uh, using uh, streams, like in Vineyard. We, we didn't demo today. Uh, in that way, we can do some pipelining, like uh, it, the streams are just ch uh, chunk streams. You can like consume chunk after chunk and chunk, chunk, and a sequence of chunk. You can consume a chunk at a time, and we can organize that as a stream. So we all can only migrate one chunk at a time, and in that case, so. Mm -hmm. Yeah, yeah, just just the data uh, in, in both cases, the data are directly mapped into the consumer's process. Uh, right, right. So that's, that's the basic uh, design paradigm, yeah. It, uh, I, just a quick question and I, I'm learning from this, is that uh, would it be uh, the data frames are on certain nodes, is that correct? Yeah. Okay, and then um, as the application consumes them, the Python application, uh, it, would it be a beneficiary to have the Python application hint in the pod specification what frames is looking for so that you could extend the Kubernetes scheduler to be out of, to, to tell the scheduler in Kubernetes, say, place this pod on this node where its data frames are? So that way that's, you don't have to move the data? That's exactly what uh, we are going to demo. <laughs> oh, <case>. sweet. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> exactly, the, the same way I'm going to demo. Awesome, thank you. I look forward to it then. <laughs> Andy, please go ahead. Uh, okay, okay, thanks, okay. So uh, the, this new global data frame, uh, it, 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 it has chunks uh, located as uh, at 192 and 193. Uh, as well, okay. Um, now this time, before we run PyTorch, we first uh, uh, install the scheduled plugin to uh, to Kubernetes. Okay. Um, yeah, that's a, that's a plugin. That's a scheduler plugin. Louis just talked about. Yes. Uh, yeah. Uh, okay. Later, we will uh, inspect the logs from this uh, scheduled plugin to to see how we schedule the pod. Okay, now let's uh, go back to the state state for uh, state for set YAML. Here to let the scheduler knows uh, which uh, one object is required by the pod. We add this spec uh, to to the pod spec. Okay, so uh, now we can run the PyTorch now. Um, so actually, when when the scheduler is is trying to uh, schedule the port, uh, it it will first uh, get get the uh, one object ID from uh, from the that that spec, and then it uh, uh, since we are using state for set, uh, it, each port will has a rank. Uh, based on the rank and the object ID, the scheduler can understand uh, which uh, chunks are required by that port. Then it will inst uh, inspect the location info from the uh, CRDs to know uh, which node has that chunks. Uh, then it will give the node the highest score. Uh, for example, here, the node 193 and node 192 has the highest, highest score. Okay, so let's go back to check the ports. Uh, here we can see that these two uh, PyTorch ports uh, has been uh, scheduled to 193 uh, and 192. 
Uh, let's uh, look at uh, the logs of the work zero again. And there is no data migration happens and the time is very small. Okay, let's check the, the local objects. And, and there is no replicated uh, local objects because there is no uh, data migration uh, happens. So here, the, uh, uh, here the, the data migration and the scheduled plugin is just one of the functionalities uh, provided by OneYard uh, in Kubernetes. And we want to uh, integrate uh, the ability of Kubernetes in to achieve uh, advanced functions uh, like checkpointing, uh, fault recovery, and so on. Uh, we hope we can build a, a new cloud native way of building and running big data applications on Kubernetes. Thanks. That's all for our demo. Thank, Thank you very much. This this was this was really um, this was really informative. It it really helped me um, visualize a bit more <laughs> um, how how Vineyard works and, and and some of the architecture because I think it's um, it's a complicated concept. Yeah, it's a bit. Sorry, I missed the last presentation. Um, but just a general question, how do you compare one yard with something like Spark on Kubernetes? Uh, Spark? Uh, Apache Spark, yes. Uh, you mean Apache Spark? Oh yeah, oh, uh, it's, it's, uh, it's quite different. Actually, the, the one yard it's like interface is very low level. It's actually the shared memory. Uh, it, you can use all kinds of like the language of your choice and the, the Runtime, the, the the execution model, uh, your choice to like build big data applications on top of Vineyard. Like you can use a, a data flow like Spark, or you can use MPI jobs, or you can run OpenMP parallel computation, or you can even use some single machine algorithms. Like so, you can choose everything. But for Spark, it's actually it has a fixed like uh, a fixed programming model and a fixed like communication model, a fixed uh, running model. So it's it's kind of restrictive. Like if we want to develop, for example, efficient graph computations or some efficient machine learning uh, pipelines, sometimes Spark is not the most efficient way to implement that. So that's, uh, how one yard is different from like Spark in our case. Um, just to summarize that, therefore, um, am I getting this right? Would it be fair to say that that Vineyard is is almost like um, an in-memory um, kind of MapReduce capability, which can plug into multiple so so multiple apps can it be accessing that same those same shared memory chunks in in, in parallel when you have a multi-step pipeline for your for your analytics for example yeah yeah that's correct uh, but uh, basically but that also applies to spark <laughs> so spark but, but exactly yeah. emerged to be an in-memory data store equivalent of MapReduce or hadoop uh, but i think the bigger difference is really the flexibility of the framework, as you said, right? Yeah, the flexibility is what we aim for. Like, uh, for example, there are some HPC uh, tasks using MPI, like you build the, the application itself is an MPI job. It's like, you, it's very hard to like uh, migrate that job into like the, uh, a Spark pipeline, like, uh, but, uh, get rid of GVM completely, it's, it's very hard. So um, and, uh, the wire the basically doesn't provide any computation um, support. You choose your way of communication. You can use RDMA, you can use some magical tunnel, you can use your the common TCP IP socket. It's your call. Uh, 
you doesn't enforce any like execution model. For example, you, if you want to run on GPU, it's fine. It's your call. It's it, so basically Vanilla is just a memory storage engine, like uh, can provide a cross process like memory sharing. It's not a computation framework. It's more like a in memory data store. Yeah, that's true. Thank you. Uh, you're welcome. Did anybody else um, have any other questions for the team? No, thank yeah. you for the demo. It helped a lot clarify, as Alex said over the presentation last week, where it would fit in terms of Kubernetes. So thank you. Okay, thank you. Yeah. Thank you, Eric. Uh, uh, we, we would like to submit our uh, project as a sandbox, as we mentioned in the last meeting. And uh, uh, we are wondering if uh, is there any way we can like uh, have feedback from the, the SIG storage uh, community uh, in some form. Uh, I'm, I'm not sure whether that's necessary, but uh, yeah, we really want some feedback here. So it's, um, I think Amy's on the, or I'm not sure if Amy's still here. Actually, she might have dropped off. Um, so so st strictly speaking, um, a, a SIG recommendation isn't needed for the, um, for the, for our sandbox submission. Um, but what, um, what we can do is we can provide, you know, a little, um, a little snippet of of, uh, of of a comment to kind of say that you have presented and, and and we think it's interesting and it's worth going into sandbox, and also provide um, a recording of the of the SIG meeting, which you can use in your in your sandbox submission, because the sandbox submission is just is just um, um, effectively a, a a form that you fill in and and then the TOC um, review it at, the, at their next meeting. Okay, okay. Thank you. Thank you very much. Okay, thank you. Very cool. So thank you again for that. We really, really appreciate that. That, that was brilliant. Um, thank you. The, the next thing we had uh, for, on the agenda was um, to, to follow up uh, the discussion around the, the disaster recovery um, documents. Uh, that uh, that uh, Raffaele has been um, focusing on and, and, and contributing, um, just so that everybody is on the same page. I will um, put the link into the into the chat window. Um, so we we could we could definitely um, do with um, more feedback and and you know comments as we as we continue to um, refine and 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 bring more ideas uh, into the documents. Um, Raphael and I um, had a, a, a brief conversation um, yesterday, and we we discussed. Um, we discussed a, a, a few topics, which which I just wanted to to run through to see if um, if there's sort of feedback on this call about things that we might want to include in the document. So, um, so the first thing was we we had um, we had a discussion about uh, documenting more clearly some of the. Um, you know some of the advantages of of cloud native uh, disaster recovery as a as a as a general concept um, in terms of for example having um, standardized versions of all of the software in, in in the kubernetes clusters by virtue of the fact that you know everything's containerized and um, standardized versions of deployments and configuration through the use of you know YAML and, and being able to have declarative and, and, and composable um, application deployment and storage. Um, 
and you know that's that kind of leads to a number of advantages that, that we saw so for example you know it, it dramatically simplifies testing failover and dr processes it, it, it dramatically simplifies um keeping multiple clusters in sync because you know they're all built on the same config um so Raphael, did have i captured that thought process was there anything else that we in relation to that yeah no you captured well i think one of the other advantages we were uh, thinking of is the ability to autonomously decide that there is a disaster right that in contrast to more traditional disaster recovery where it's a human decision often right um writing it out yeah that's, i'm taking that's, notes that's, too that's, <laughs> uh, that, that's uh that's a good point um i don't know if anybody else um on the call um who who you know maybe um that works on you know ha or or, or dr with with um perhaps their customers or or anything like that whether whether you know there were any other um, things that that maybe we can we can focus on in terms of the advantages of of DR and cloud native. Yeah, I can talk about it a little bit. Um, so it's quite challenging to say you know what considers an outage, especially in cloud environments, especially because in cloud you know there are different services like load balancers, compute. And outage means different things in each context, especially like a zonal outage, you know, or things like that. And there is really no good way of defining or detecting outages. Like, so most like what we usually end up with is some arbitrary thresholds as far as if X percentage of nodes are down, we would consider like a zonal outage. And obviously the semantics of outage also mean different things for if you look, if you're looking at it from the from the perspective of infrastructure versus application, uh, look from applications point of view, applications like etcd or distributed data stores, they do replication, and they obviously have, you know, different view of what outage means versus if you're trying to just look at it from the infrastructure's point of view, in terms of, you know, whether nodes in a given zone. In a cluster or off or not. So I think based on mm. how we're looking at things and which layers we're exploring, we may arrive at different results. Uh, and you know how we can distinguish from like temporary outages like network blips versus more sustained outages. I mean I have more experience in GCP with all these problems, but I imagine like they're different in each cloud or you know on-prem. I think what we're trying to do with this document is to provide guidance that abstracts from the underlying root cause or possible root cause of an outage and just give you an, a, a guidance on how you organize your stateful workloads to survive an outage, whatever that, whatever the root cause is, right? Um, we want to be able to do it without having human intervention, like I was saying, without losing state or you know having zero rpo and having the lowest rto as possible I, that that's what we're trying i that's that's where where i'm trying to go with this document i, I think i think um it's still useful though to to capture you know the things that are that are hard to do as well right because um on the one hand, you know, having um, having a cloud native disaster recovery pattern defined is 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 important, and there are lots of pros. But obviously, from an operational point of view, things like defining what constitutes an outage and what are the thresholds for for um, failover and and for you know. The differences between degraded service versus a, a, an outright failure of a zone 
are, are, are probably worth, worth articulating, I imagine, because those are things that you will have to think about and you will have to define. Okay, then maybe Ardalan, I could use some help. You know, we could we could start. Oh, I, I was just thinking that if you. Yeah. yeah, I just got access to your document and I just, you know, scanned it very quickly. So yeah. I like the way you are, you know, describing the fundamentals of, you know, cat theorem, things like that. Um, Look, in very abstract ways, you were basically describing the problem. You know, obviously, if you want to tolerate an outage, there has the data has to be replicated. Um, like, to, if you're doing like a zonal outage or regional outage, so um, I mean, it all depends on like how abstract we want to keep the document or how generic you want to keep it. Um, uh, I, I haven't had a chance to read the whole thing. De in detail, right. so I don't know exactly what what your goal is, larger goals. If it's just providing a some basically some level setting for people to under, to be familiar with the concepts, or we're actually trying to come up with a set of guidelines so people can build solutions on top of them. It's the latter that you said. Let's do this. Um, if you're willing to contribute, why don't you take um, your time to read it? And, and maybe drop comments and maybe we can also collaborate, um, you know, uh, set up some meetings and collaborate together. Um, the Sounds other thing, good, yeah. Yeah. okay, thank yeah, you. I'll be happy to comment on the document, yeah. Yeah, the other thing I was gonna ask for the, to the team is, I realized this is a, a long document. Some of you have actually read it and, and provided feedback and I, I'm very thankful of that, but I think we need more before there is a consensus to go ahead and, and do something with it. Um, so I was wondering, would it help if I created a deck with, you know, a summary on the main concepts of the document, and then maybe a, a presented the deck in one of the next meetings? Well, um, a deck to to summarize would would always be um, would always be extremely valuable, um, and we can also, you know, use that content perhaps to to you know create um, a blog in future or or a webinar or or, or, or something like that because you know the mm -hmm. the we, we we have done. Um, webinars on the on on the uh, through the CNCF as well in the past, so that that sort of thing would definitely be useful, I'm sure. Okay, so I'll take that as a to do as well as continue working on the document with the feedback. So, that I'm receiving. Raphael, it's Aaron. Um, Hi. I think it's good to give a little bit of history. Is this the same doc that has kind of been in progress for a while when I was still there? in that I think it's really hard for people who are adopting Kubernetes in a not completely cloud deployment um, to understand the complexities of, of running it on-prem and on cloud and taking our traditional storage concepts and trying to apply them to cloud native. And I think that's maybe the goal of this is to take what people are normally used to as far as their RTO and RPO in terms of storage and what that looks like if we run that in cloud and how we can achieve that capability and to Ardalan's point, like we have to have replication. Mm -hmm. I think just some perspective is also about what are the costs associated with that? Because that seems to be a concern when I talk to a lot of different people about deploying things this way, you know, that are at huge scale. Um, what are the, the benefits and possible drawbacks so that that would be helpful if we also outline those for people and I would Ardalan what do you mean by like you know being specific are you talking about creating use cases for each one of the clouds and how we know that they work or trying not to be specific what was your comment there yeah so 
<laughs> so I think, I mean, it, it, it kind of depends on how we look at it. So for example, like, you know, I work at NetApp and in the storage, um, people usually talk about like five nines, six nines, you know, of availability, like RTO of, you know, a few seconds or, you know, uh, it's a very, the, the way we talk about our real high availability is somewhat different than the cloud world, you know, uh, where, you know, for example, if you look at the SLAs of AWS or GCP, you know, they usually talk about like 99.5 or 9.5 availability, you know, and if you're building a cloud native solution, unlike on-prem storage solutions where you can control the whole stack networking, uh, it's, it's a different kind of beast in the cloud world. Right, so um, I think some of it is like cultural. Like basically, we have to talk about these terms a little differently, and that's also I think hard for storage consumers. But I think that that's something we should kind of like let others know that you know you can make the same sort of guarantees that you can make for the on-prem systems, the way you know you can do for Vmax, <laughs> or you know, uh, but right. also so. whether you know like I. Mean, I this is the first, I just got access to the Word doc today, right, just right. 30 minutes ago. So I don't, I don't know exactly what the document is about, but right. you know. Let's work together on that because sure. I think you will find, it, it was an interesting insight for me as I was doing this research in, in, in what I call the cloud, cloud native DR, which is defining this document, right? And <laughs> uh, you don't have to agree, but what I call cloud native DR, disaster recovery, the features, the capabilities that enable disaster recovery don't come from storage. That could be a little surprising because historically storage has been essentially, the storage and the storage team have been providing this, these capabilities for the entire um, enterprise, right? The, the insight here, the discovery for me was that these capabilities now come from networking. Uh, storage has to be there, still has an important role. Uh, we still need backups for logical failures, but not for DR. We still, we probably don't need volume replication in this new world uh, because the responsibility of keep the state in sync is to the application uh, or okay. the middle. In many ways, like volume of data replication becomes the responsibility of the cloud provider, right? Because no, they're no, doing no, it on no, the, no, the, no, the, no, the no. To so some extent, I don't say completely. Cloud really, it's not a storage problem, it's an application problem. So it would be responsibility of the database, it would be responsibility of the queue or the cache, right. or whatever middleware you're using. So that's no, where... Yeah, my, my point is, it's not as critical as it is on-prem because of the way, for example, let's say AWS EBS does replication on their side or GCP PDs they do. Versus with on-prem, you're solely relying on the storage solution to do the replication. So that was I'm, a point I'm, of, I'm, but I agree. I'm, there I'm is really trying to make the application point. level. It, it's either on-prem or on uh, in the cloud. We don't rely on any of those capabilities. If if in this in the pattern that is explained in this document, we truly rely uh, solely on on the application. Sorry, I, I just want to make I, I just want to make an important point because because I, I I feel we're we're in danger of going off in a dangerous tangent. The 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 point that we're trying to talk about here is not about the capabilities of individual platforms. It's more about the architectural patterns um, that would be implemented. And and in fact, you know the the, the architectural patterns that that we're discussing um, in this document are not linked to you know any spe specific cloud provider or you know on-prem provider or or, or or anything like that in fact it's 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 more about this is how you would engineer um this is about how you would engineer a system and cater for consistency and make sure that um data is available in multiple places and then allow for you know the the the, the failovers across you know different kubernetes clusters etc that's kind of the concept of what we're talking about here. Um, we're not we're not specifically saying at any point that 
you know, you would do volume replication in a certain way or database replication in a certain way, but 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 more around the point of saying, you know, we you you need load balancing capability and you need you know a middleware or, or or a database layer that that can do the replication or you can have replication happening at the volume layer um but but the point is you know we're not talking about the specific platforms in fact this is if you wish a generic way of 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 defining dr that that can be used in in, in any cloud native um, environment right Thank you, Alice. Yes, in fact, we from the internal documents that Erin was referring to before, we I stripped away everything that was Kubernetes related or OpenShift related. It's all it's very very generic now. That the pattern should work anywhere, whether you use machine with or machines in the cloud, whether you use containers on prem, where, wherever you are, the pattern, this pattern that we are presenting, should work. Actually, I think it will work. Um, and that not to say in this document, we are not saying that's the only way to do it. We are just saying, look, there is cloud enables this new way because everything is declarative and automated. But then you can also use all the traditional tools that, that you have for, for DR. And you, you see in the document that we list, that there are listed all the, the traditional approaches also. But we are trying to make the point, at least I'm trying to make the point that there is probably a new way that should be considered. I think it's ripe for discussion, to be perfectly honest. Um, I'm part of the, the end user group now as well in the CNCS, and there is a lot of discussion around storage and durability and availability. And the, the consensus for most users of Kubernetes is that they can't, the storage is, not, I don't think they use the word dependable, but they haven't had good success. Um, so I think it's also one of the topics I brought up on the, the TOC yesterday is I'd like to have a little more focus from them as well as projects and ideas and, and how we take these things and socialize them a little bit better so that people can achieve the same things hopefully they can do on-prem or in private cloud that they, they can do in in cloud so they have a consistent way of doing things. I think that's what we're trying to achieve is we can still rely on the storage regardless of how we're deploying it using these particular patterns. So was that what you're going for, Raphael? Alex, does that sound reasonable? Yeah, definitely. Okay. Would that team be interested in talking about these things? The user I'd love to talk sure. about these things because I, I think I have definitely my old Red Hat perspective and now Apple's perspective. And I think it's interesting to see the two melt together. So mm -hmm. I'd love to hear the diversity of thought around this and what people are doing and customers are expecting. So, okay. There is yeah, a, a I, Twitch. I, I, um, oh, sorry, go, uh, on. go ahead. Go ahead, Alex. No, no, no. Go, go. Um, uh, so, so, look, I, I, we're we're coming up, we're coming up to time. I, I, I just wanted to say, look, these are all good points, but we, um, we should make sure that we that we contribute to the document, um, and you know, if need be, add paragraphs, add comments, um, and we can we can you know then further discuss and, and merge them together, and we can have. Um, separate follow-up calls if we want to discuss any particular points in, in, in a bit more detail, if we want to structure the content in a particular way, for example. I think we are at time. Rafael, was there anything else you wanted to add before we go? No, I'm okay. Um, Erin, I'll, I'll contact you uh, uh, privately. Just we can continue that discussion. Good. Okay. Yeah, just hit me up on Slack. Thanks. Yeah. Cool. Thank you, everyone. Thank you. Bye. Thank you. Bye-bye. Bye-bye.